I want to welcome you here today to, I think it's the fifth this year, uh, the Schulich Schools of Law mini lecture on law. And this one is basically on your will and you. What you have to know about wills. It may be some of the things that you don't want to know. Uh, the topic is um, joined in my mind and I think in practice with two other documents that when you uh, decide to draw a will you should look at. And the first document is a power of attorney. And the second document is a personal care directive. These are extremely important documents which should be discussed at least at the time of the making of your will. The first question that you're going to ask me, and I get this right, is why have a will? Why do you have to have a will? Well, the obvious thing is that for some of us, our estate represents the economic fruits of a lifetime. And it would be a pity if it devolved around the next generation in a way or to whom one didn't want. And I put it to you, and I am no shill for the lawyer, the practicing lawyer but that in order to do anything but the simplest will, and I know all you think your will is simple, not so, uh, but all but the simplest will, you really do need some lawyerly input, some lawyerly support in drawing up a will. And you'll find that when you start pricing them, that generally speaking in practice, wills are lost leaders, so they're not that expensive. Now, however, there are other good reasons for having a will, just because you want what you have to go to the right people at the right time in the right way. The other reason is if you don't have a will, then your property does devolve on death, but according to a government drawn will, which is called the Intestate Succession Act. And there are aspects of the Intestate Succession Act which I don't think represent contemporary values. Uh, for example, uh, when you get a government drawn will, depending on the numbers, there's a good chance that this person might inherit. Kind of a nice picture, isn't it? But I look at that picture, think a little boy, and I think of the sleepless nights, and I think of the terrible twos, and then that period just before teenagerhood, and then teenagerhood, and I think to myself that as far as my state is concerned, and I suspect yours, you don't want to share it with your kids, not immediately. And so this aspect of a government drawn will where the kids get part of the will is probably unacceptable to most people. And in other words, they can't afford it either. So if you have a government drawn will, there is a possibility that some parts of the estate, especially in a marriage situation, will go to the kids when there is a, survi a surviving spouse. And mostly people don't want that result. Another problem, and I think it's a problem that I find with my classes, I'm just shocked. And sometimes it's hard in practice situations to investigate, is that many more people nowadays are living common law. And what they don't understand, I have more and more students tell me that living common law nowadays in this liberal society of Canada is just like being legally married. Not so. On death, the common law spouse in Nova Scotia gets nothing, inherits nothing. And so for the common law spouse to inherit in Nova Scotia, they must be in the will. Now there are ways of getting around this, I understand. In fact, this is what I write about. And this is how a lot of other lawyers make a lot of money. But I've, I just hold it close to yourself 
and say that if I'm a common law spouse, I won't inherit under a government will. I will under a private will, a privately drawn will, if the person names me in that will. And I can think of a couple of cases in Nova Scotia where this was played out, and they're really quite shocking in some ways. One case, one early case, uh, uh, two people, a partner, husband, or uh, two spouses, uh, partner spouses, but not married, not legally married, lived together for 10 years. And they had two kids. And the husband, who's a great fan of motorcycles, uh, died in a crash. Immediately the husband died, his parents went to court to sue for his whole estate over his common law spouse and his two young kids, which I find extraordinary. But sometimes it's only on death and when money's concerned that you really find out what families are about, I guess. Anyway, the court, the court said, well, we're, we're going to take the illegitimate out of illegitimate children, and all children are children, and they inherit from their father. But as far as the spouse was concerned, she didn't ask, nor did she get a nickel from that estate. So it is a word to the wise. Um, another example of a case in, in Nova Scotia about common law spouses uh, was a case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada and the court said, well, if you are a common law spouse, you must have made some sort of conscious decision not to share property. And I really agree with the sole dissenting and sole female member of that court who said, if marriage functions like, if a relationship functions like marriage, it should be treated in law like it is marriage. But notwithstanding that, the court said no. In this case, a common law spouse uh, couldn't inherit. So that's another reason for having a will. Well, you might think, well, I'm a dink, dual income, no kids fancy free, I've got a partner, but so what? Well, there's something called the Survivorships Act in Nova Scotia, and in my picture here, that's Jack and Jill, and they're going skydiving, and I understand there's been quite a few accidents over time in skydiving. Where you die with your partner in a common accident, the law of Nova Scotia says that the older dies first and then the younger. And you say, so what? But if you're relying on a government-drawn will, that means the older, older partner, usually the, the man is a year or two older, he dies first, his property flows to the younger partner, the wife, and then her property, because she's dead too, flows to her parents. So that you have a funny situation in a professional couple where if they die, all their money ends up on one side of the family or on the other. So even if you're a professional partner with, uh, partners with no kids, you want to have a will. Um, There are lots of other reasons for having a will. Uh, you can leave specific personal effects to friends or gifts to favorite charities. And you can make provision for this person who you may dearly love. My colleague Vaughn Black in the law school um, would like to um, attribute to this person, a personality of some sorts in law. In any case, uh, the fact is that we own pets. Now my cat thinks she owns persons, but she uh, is under a misapprehension. Leon, Leon, Leona Helmsley, the notorious hotel queen, actually left property to her dog, and it was several millions of dollars. And I read an article about the ma major problems facing the care caretakers of this dog with such 
you know, serious money and, and a, a heavy onus. And the main problem was that they were afraid the dog was going to be kidnapped. Now, I don't think when we we're preparing or looking after our animals that we're going to worry about them being kidnapped. But what we can do is we can set up small trusts in order, as in the case of my cat, to keep the cat, the dog, in kibble and catnip or whatever the, the druthers. So you can deal with animals in wills. Animals cannot inherit like people, but you can set up trusts so that they will be provided for until they die. What exactly is a trust? Oh, a trust is just um, a mechanism where someone says, I will hold property, the dog, and I will do things about that dog according to agreement between you and me, basically. A trust is just a person who will carry out certain conditions of, of uh, agreement that the a trustee agrees to. We have trust all the time. When we have a will, for example, we give gifts directly to our adult children. But if we have children, say, two, three, underage, we give gifts to the children to be held in trust for them. That is, an older person holds the money for their benefit. There's also uh, there is a number of reasons for having a will, but there are also instances where the will is not necessary. Many of you, I'll answer just a minute, many of you have the situation where you designate the beneficiary of your insurance proceeds in the insurance contract, where you designate who gets your RRSP proceeds in the bank contract, where you designate where you get your tax-free savings plans in the tax-free saving plan contract. And of course, among married people in Nova Scotia and unmarried people, many, many hold houses in joint tenancy. Whether we hold houses in joint tenancy or whether we have these special kinds of property where you don't need a will, insurance, RRSPs, tax-free savings plans, pension plans, these kinds of properties are not influenced or dealt with by a will unless particular pains are taken to include them in a will, which usually is not done. The significance of these kinds of properties and will planning is that at the, at the time that you make your will, the joint tenancy and the designations will be examined by you and your advisor. Part of the problem of designating your pension death benefits or your RRSP is that designations, unlike wills, are not avoided by a new marriage. Neither are they affected by your divorce so that one of my assistants inherited a fair amount of money on the death of her ex-spouse because he forgot to change the designation. She felt it was only her just due, of course. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot to change the designation. So when you make a will, your lawyer should make you look, go through all your designations and make sure you now have the proper beneficiaries in these designations. Uh, this happened to me, or, or a colleague of mine, who had been at Dalhousie for 20 years. When he joined Dalhousie, he uh, said the pension benefit, death benefits, would go to his parents. He was single and young. 21 year, 20 years later, he had acquired a, 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 a wife, a child, and his parents were comfortably off. So, and he had still left the designation to his parents. So he was quite shocked that he had no, there's nothing in a designation, say in an insurance or in a, a pension plan and an RSP, there's nothing really that would force you to review them.
but you should. And one of the occasions in which you should review designations is on the making of your will or on the review of your will. Making a will is also an opportunity for baby boomers in particular to review estate planning options. And the estate planning options don't have to necessarily accrue to only to those who have a lot of money. Estate planning options or tax options or might be something that you can discuss with your advisor when they're making a will. For example, what I find working in the area of disabilities is that many families who have members with disabilities do not take advantage of the tax provisions given to people with disabilities in Canada. And the reason of, of this is essentially a shocking one, that they are so complex so intertwined, so complicated, that many people just sort of give up and trying to wade their way around the different benefits are given to people with persons with disabilities or given to people with disabilities. And so the, making your will gives you the opportunity to look at some benefits that might be available to your family and frankly, one of the big things that families want to do with persons with disabilities is they want them to both, one, inherit something, and two, not have their social welfare benefits eliminated. And that is, in, as you can see, at least for a short period, in conflict. But there are ways, quite easy ways, to uh, eliminate this conflict, and so that's one thing in making your will, if you have a beneficiary who might be on social welfare benefit, benefits, to look at some of the special trusts that can be set up to eliminate this problem. But you can't do everything you want when you make your will. And your will is limited by, I say, four separate things. Your will is limited by the Matrimonial Property Act in Nova Scotia. Whatever you do in Nova Scotia, you must first face the Matrimonial Property Act, which means that your will takes place after the Matrimonial Property Act does its deed. So what does the Matrimonial Property Act in Nova Scotia say? It says basically that legally married, legally married, not common law, Legally married spouses have a presumptive 50% share to the, quote, matrimonial assets of, of the couple when they separate, when they divorce, or when they die. So before you even get to your will, you have to go through the Matrimonial Property Act. Now, you know and I know that there are ways to reduce entitlements under Matrimonial Property Act, particularly with egregiously bad conduct or very short marriages. That's cr that is correct. But for many of us, what we're looking at is sharing our assets 50-50 with our legally married spouse. Um, it should be clear, then, that if... Uh, someone dies, the survivor gets 50% of the matrimonial assets. And it's only what's left over in the deceased estate that gets uh, treatment by either the government will or the, uh, uh, the actual private will. Now, there's two things that are left out of matrimonial assets, and I think it's very important for you to understand that. Two things that are not, that don't go through the matrimonial assets and just go through wills. And the first thing is business assets. Any business assets that are not jointly owned by the spouse basically are not subject to matrimonial assets, matrimonial property law. This law is going to be changed very soon, but it hasn't been changed, so I have to tell you uh, the law as it is. 
So if uh, dad runs a construction company and uh, it's run separate from everything else, then that construction company is business assets and it is not divisible under the Matrimonial uh, Property Act. This position in Nova Scotia is considered rather regressive and is, I think, unique in Canada insofar as instead of looking at matrimonial asset and saying all assets are thrown into the pot, uh, Nova Scotia says only matrimonial assets and they exclude a great source of wealth which is business assets. The second thing that you want to pay attention to, to and this, this is some significance in some families, I'd like to hear if you've had this particular issue, but inheritances, if you inherit something and then you die, where does that inheritance go? Well, the rule so far in Nova Scotia is if you get an inheritance, it goes into the matrimonial property and has to be shared. As long as that inheritance is used in family activities. So take an example of a cottage. If you have a cottage up at Tanamagoosh and uh, you inherit it from your mother, for example, and you take your wife and kids down there over summer and they swim and they do all the wonderful things that people do in Tatamagoosh, well, that's obviously a family asset and has to be shared on death. But what happens if you have a cottage in Tatamagoosh, which you inherit and you uh, rent it out and you take the rental income and you put it in a separate bank account, not a family bank account, well, that wouldn't be a family asset and therefore wouldn't be inheritable or, or wouldn't be subject to the Matrimonial Property Act. So what I say here, and the first thing you have to recognize, is figure out what the deceased person has to give under the will. Because the deceased person doesn't give anything under the will until you look through the operation and application of the Matrimonial Property Act. Someone had a question here. Am I well beyond it or what? So I was just going to ask, uh, did, did, what does the law say about actually gifting a pet to someone? Is that legal? Gifting a what? Gifting a, a family pet to someone else in your will. Is oh, I think that's very important that you ask that. Uh, because an animal, rightly or wrongly, is just property. So, I mean, subject to animal control things and whatever. No, you gift, in fact, you should gift your dog, yeah, to whomever you want to look after them. And probably set up a trust so the person who's looking after them will have something, some money for vet fees and whatever. Yes? For inheritance stuff, what about uh, you know, shares or whatever? Oh, shares, yeah. yeah. So where are they? Oh, right. The question is, uh, if a person had a lot of shares, would they be considered investments? Would they be considered matrimonial properties or, uh, or, or not? And the answer is generally the courts have not been very happy about seeing exemptions and exclusions from the matrimonial property law. And so they have tended to see um, RRSPs and tax-free savings plans and that sort of thing, minor investments where you use the dividends to finance family vacation as uh, matrimonial property. Well, now, if you get a big chunk, that would be different. If they're inherited, though, it's, it's still the same? Yes, if they're inherited. It, as long as you're using them for family purposes. Now, if they get separated, that's a different thing. But it was quite interesting, I think, the court said very early on that amounts saved in an RRSP for retirement were family assets. I, I'm not saying that all wouldn't be. I'm just saying that a lot of them are. Yes? How fine do, does the uh, Matrimonial Property Act go in defining what the assets are. For example, if you know if you want to leave items in your estate to your grandchildren, yeah. then I mean it, from from fifty fifty it would look like you can't do that unless no. you and your wife both both Because she takes half. 
Yeah. And then you just got half to, to bequeath. Yes. So can, so can you cover that then by an agreement, uh, a written agreement that you and your wife agree that this should be given to a grandchild? Yes, you can. Um, that's what's called or can be called a mutual will. And uh, it's becoming more of use now than it used to be, which is what it is is a, a will that you draw up, and, you, and I'm not talking about it in detail here because it's tricky to do it. You say, you're the husband, I draw, draw up my will in a certain way on condition you draw up your will in a certain way. It is usually, but not always, me to you for life, you to me for life, and then to common beneficiaries that we agree upon. So you can, you can do that as a mutual will, you can do, but it is, it's not used much. And I say to my clients, well, I'll use it, but I'm not absolutely certain it'll work for a lot of reasons, we haven't got time to go into it, but that's, that's one way of looking at it. The other way, frankly, is if you feel strongly about it, is just to give the asset to the grandchildren while you're alive. My other question, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's a pretty touchy subject, but it's becoming more and more common. What if one partner is not um, capable of functioning mentally by the time the other partner dies? Yes. Uh, who, on a 50-50 basis, who controls the other partner's assets? You, you ask a, a question that must be of interest to many of us sitting here, which is what happens when incapacity, a lack of legal capacity, rears its hair, head, and what is that? Well, for one thing, to do anything with wills, it is necessary to have capacity to draw up a will. So the first thing is if a, a partner has diminishing capacity, then um, the f you have to determine one if there is pa c capacity. And secondly, if it tends to do diminishing, I think I would get a will drawn very quickly. Okay, well, what do you have to know to draw up a will? What, what kinds of things do you have to know? Well, you have to know the nature of a will, that it is a will. You have to know, in a very broad terms, the nature and the extent of your property. You have to know, sort of in broad terms, the family and friends who would uh, be your natural object of your bounty. And finally, you can't be under any delusion that would distort the making of the will. For example, many older people think their children are stealing from them. This is very common. And that would be a delusion that would not allow them to make their will. They wouldn't have capacity. If a person doesn't have capacity, then the, their, and they don't have a will, the property will go according to a government-drawn will. You can't make up a will if you don't have capacity. Um, the other thing is, if you leave property to someone who have, haven't got capacity, then someone has to look after it for them. And in that case, I would recommend that you give someone a power of attorney or set up trusts that I'm gonna talk about a little later to, to uh, hold the property for the incapacitated partner. The other thing, and I want to emphasize this to everybody, is that once a person draws up a will with capacity, they can never, never revoke the will unless they regain capacity. So for me, it's almost less about capacity to draw up a will and almost the fact that people sometimes get stuck with wills that they wouldn't want to have because they don't have capacity to revoke those wills. Does that answer some of the questions? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'd like to know if you had a marriage agreement, would the maximum of property tax override that? Or that? No, it wouldn't. Jet, well, I don't know. I'd have to see the actual marriage agreement. But usually a domestic agreement is something that would allow you to opt out of the provisions of the Matrimonial Property Act. And it really could only be challenged 
if it was unconscionable or if you didn't, you know, in various ways that you didn't understand what you're signing or you didn't understand, you know, the nature of it or that sort of thing. But uh, no, once you sign, you're kind of stuck. What determines incapacity and what's the process for invoking a power of attorney when there is incapacity? Okay, then we, we look at... Uh, uh, incapacity and we have a, lo a beloved partner who is incapable cannot make a will. Uh, one of the alternatives to making a will is uh, well uh, to making a will but also to deal with yourself while you're incapacitated but you are not deceased is a power of attorney. The power of attorney lets someone else, that someone else being the attorney, operate your affairs as if they were you. Now, when I was at the Advocacy Center for the Elderly and I had an exit uh, interview, the person asked me, well, what big thing in dealing with our clients did you learn? And I said, I learned one thing, and it's a power of attorney is a bomb. It actually, to mix metaphors horribly, gives the keys to the vault. There are ways that lawyers can lessen the impact of power of attorney. There are mechanisms, such as having appointing mentor, mentors to look after powers of attorney, to make powers of attorney not broad general powers of attorney, which allow the attorney to do everything, but only allow the attorney to do things in specific areas at specific times. We as as uh, lawyers are responsible for drawing up power of attorneys that match the particular circumstance and provide as much uh, protection to the donor, the person who gives the, the power of attorney, as is possible. Because we now live in a jurisdiction where we don't register power of attorney. Basically, no one monitors them. It's just, you know, totally nothing. Nothing looks after them until usually it's too late. So, um, so if I had a power of attorney drawn up, I wouldn't allow this precedent one that someone pulled down from a book on a shelf and said, this is my power of attorney, which allowed you as attorney to do every everything. No, not that kind. A power of attorney, frankly, has to be properly drafted. It has to be normally limited, and it has to have a mechanism within it to uh, make sure that there's some uh, monitoring going on. Yeah. Can you speak to the difference between the power of attorney when it comes to your care versus your assets and the kind of standards that are applied there? Yes. Um, because when we talked about power of attorney, I thought I understood uh, you to speak of a power of attorney with respect to financial affairs. And that's what I'm talking about, a power of attorney with respect to financial affairs but a power of attorney with respect to health affairs is a, is a different sort of kettle of fish. Uh, they could be in one, one piece of paper or one envelope, but basically they're drawn up separately. And a personal care directive is something that you should draw up. And the first thing that a personal care directive is it nominates a delegate to make your health care decisions after you lack capacity to make health care decisions. So someone to do that. And it goes beyond health care decisions. It goes to where you live and what kind of entertainment and how you dress and who you associate. So there's a person that looks after your finances, a person who looks after your health care uh, and gives consent or not for various procedures. The tricky thing about a personal directive is that not only people wish to nominate someone to make their health care decisions when they can anymore, but they attempt to draw up what we know as a living will. And a living will is an indication of your attitudes and beliefs about end-of-life issues. And uh, I was kind of keen on this sort of thing, and perhaps I will be brought around with different experiences until I assigned one of my classes when I was relatively young 
to write one of these things for an older client, a theoretical client, who was 59. And uh, the young people in my room, in writing a living will, kind of took the point of, well, 59, it's so old, we'll just <laughs> take away all recitation. All. And uh, it made, what it made me think, frankly, was that uh, one's views about death and what you want really do change over time. And although you're not stuck with a healthcare directive, insofar as people can prove that technology or your views have changed, then the court will change the healthcare directive. Nonetheless, being somewhat unaware of various technological and, and uh, medical breakthroughs, I, I tend to be very quiet about that in my healthcare directive. Okay. Okay, um, I was talking about the Matrimonial Health uh, uh, Property Act. Getting back, if you recall, what I was talking about was limitations to the ability to put in a will whatever you want. And the first limitation was the Matrimonial Property Act. The second limitation is the Testator's Family Act. That's the act in which the judge can remake your will and everybody's so afraid of. And the third reason you can't put anything in your will you want is something called public policy. And I'll talk about that in a minute. And the fourth reason is a whole fraught uh, area of digital assets, which I'm now writing a paper on. So um, we're going to go over through, that's matrimonial assets. Uh, we're going to look at testator's family maintenance application. That is the legislation in Nova Scotia and elsewhere which allows a will, uh, uh, excuse me, a judge to redraw your will. Now I hope all of you haven't gone out and made a will and left uh, one dollar to your least favorite sibling or child because that won't work. Um, but in a very famous case in the Supreme Court level, the court laid out very strong, uh, a very strong path, a good path, as to when your will is going to be upset. When am I will going to be upset? Well, the first thing is, who can upset my will? Well, it depends in which province you reside, but in Nova Scotia, the people that can contest your will are basically your spouse and kids and grandchildren. It's a small group of people. In places like Ontario, it's a much broader group of people. It can be uh, siblings and all sorts of people, but we don't have that great uh, group of people in Nova Scotia. There's two bases on which you can, can, can contest a will. The first basis is if you have a legal obligation to the person before you die. And that always means the spouse. Now, nowadays, spouses are making less applications under testator's family maintenance because they're getting their half under matrimonial property. But still, testator's family maintenance, the, the, the um, one person is the wife, the spouse, legally married spouse, and secondly, the children. But the children are minor children, and adult children who have not, because they're disabled, been able to withdraw from the care of their parents. So those people, depending on the size of the estate, depending upon the conduct of the various parties, can, uh, depending on the uh, contributions of the particular applicant for monies, uh, compared to the ordinary standard of living of the applicants. The judges will make some determination. There is, however, another aspect of the will redrawing areas, and that is with respect to adult children who are not disabled, who are not dependent, and raise their hand and say, Mommy, Daddy, uh, I don't like your will. I think more should have gone to me and less to my siblings. And how do the courts in Nova Scotia deal with that? Yeah? 
Could you tell me, do you see there any legal difference between biological children, adopted children, and the children of a spouse from your previous marriages or his previous marriages? That's a good question. Generally speaking, in Nova Scotia, there is no difference between adopted children, uh, legal children, and illegitimate children. There is no difference. The court treats them all the same. There isn't a distinction among children uh, anymore. Uh, but under this uh, Testator Family Maintenance Act, it's children who are na your children, not stepchildren, for example. It doesn't include stepchildren. Children of your body or who are adopted. Um, the one issue is adult children, and that's the one that everybody seems to be concerned about that you have a happy little family and you have uh, someone that's been way away and nobody likes very much and what do you owe that person? What does a person drawing up a will in Nova Scotia owe to an adult? And the answer is probably not very much. And the chances of an adult contesting a will in Nova Scotia and getting anything are very, very little. Nonetheless, when the court looked at obligations under a will, it said first you're obliged to persons who you really had a legal obligation to um, support. That is a disabled child, the spouse, the minor child. And to the reasonable expectations of a dependent sort of in respect or in relation to community standards. So now I'm telling you you have to give money under your will to an adult child because of something called community standards. Well, what does that mean? Here's an example. Um, it was a New Brunswick case uh, originally, I think. New Brunswick, B Br uh, British Columbia case. Dad was a bit of a curmudgeon. He lived in BC with his wife. She was a poor soul who was, I think, um, dominated by her husband. They had two children. One of, the ch one of the sons was a favorite son, and he couldn't do anything wrong. And the other son was a non-favorite son who, for no reason, um, except in his father's eyes, couldn't do anything right. And so in the course of eventually the uh, father drew up a will and disinherited practically his spouse and his disfavored husband, uh, wife, disfavored son, and left most of the things to the favored son. And the court said, well, look, you can't disinherit your wife. So she got a bunch of money. And of course, the favored son got a bunch of money under the will. But interestingly enough, the disfavored husband uh, not husband, the disfavored um, uh, son got a, 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 a little bit of money under this will. And the court saying that, you know, this kind of favoritism, this uh, irrational dislike, uh, this is not in line with community standards, and so we will give you some of the money in this estate. But the bottom line is, adult children will normally not be able to challenge their parents' wills unless there's some you know, mutual uh, working together or something like that, but ordinarily not so. Any other questions? Thank you. 
Yeah. There's two issues here. Uh, the first issue is where during the lifetime one child gets more than the other. What happens when a person dies? And the second, re, re, uh, second question is who is responsible for funeral costs? It's always my view that when money is advanced to a child during lifetime, it is absolutely incumbent upon the lawyer to put this down in writing and for the nature of whatever is being given to be described, is this a gift? Is this a loan? Is this a loan with interest who comes due at only a certain time? Is this a loan which will be forgiven at death? A lot of these problems are solved if the nature of whatever is being advanced to a child during lifetime is documented, and documented not only with that child, but with the rest of the family. That's the first thing. Now, I think you're uh, asking something else, which is uh, who is required to uh, pay the funeral expenses, and the estate in the first instance is required to pay the funeral expenses. If the state doesn't have enough money to pay the funeral expenses, then there are some municipal and social welfare things that can deal with that. If people make gifts, well, that's up to them. Okay. I've kind of got off my... Uh, discussion, I was saying that there are things that keep you from dealing as easily as you would with all your state under will, the matrimonial property, the testator family maintenance. Public policy, you can't leave under will things to people you would like to. And you know, it's my home province of New Brunswick who solved this and I think very wisely and courageously took a stand when a fellow in New Brunswick uh, s uh, s laid $250,000 on a white supremacist organization in the United States. And the New Brunswick court in the last year said, no, you can't do this. This is against public policy to give money to an organization who espouses racial inequality and discrimination and violence. The courts have now taken this with some caution because this is new. We always talked about testamentary freedom. If you could give money to white supremacist organization when you're alive, the question goes, why can't you give it when you're dead? Well. You can fight that out of my classes or whatever, because we, this isn't settled yet. So some other examples. Uh, example of uh, a black daughter who was a disinherited uh, because she uh, gave birth to a son with a white man. Uh, and this one that's coming up through Ontario, which is a very interesting one, a person, a son being disinherited by his father because of his uh, um, his sexual preference. So this idea that you can kind of, at least in intimate family situations, in the small wills that we have, that we deal with our economic and personal relations in our family, wouldn't be subject to these broader policy considerations. That seems to be now at least a debatable point. And finally, digital assets. In the last couple of years, more and more of us have been acquiring digital assets, even me. Um, my, hus my husband, my son, acquired thousands of dollars as assets on the war of, war, on war of uh, which, uh, what is it? War, war of Warcraft, what is it? <laughs> World of Warcraft, that's it. <laughs> I don't get those words down easily because I wasn't too happy about it. But anyway, he quit this World of Warcraft, leaving a whole bunch of money in it, um, because he thought it was either that or university, and I think he chose wisely. 
there's those of us who might have participated in Ashley Madison, who was unfortunately hacked. Uh, and there's all, there's Dropbox, which I find really wonderful for um, uh, photographs. There's dating sites. There's all sorts of things uh, out there. In fact, some sites are of significant commercial value to people. And they uh, uh, have pro professional and commercial value in the goodwill and in the context that they have created. So who owns this kind of, well, we say it's property, but it is. Is it property? Well, it's something. If I look at my Facebook, my, my, hus uh, my son was looking at some of these uh, terms of service the other day because I knew I was ma making this lecture so he's reading them and you you know you the things before you click on I accept they go on and on and on and tiny and tiny and tiny scripts and my son who will remain nameless and has a different name from mine thank God um, <laughs> I don't think he's done everything illegal in his life and he said my god doing it illegal is so hard just pushes it back into the illegal world <laughs> So uh, if you read all those little uh, words and long, long paragraphs under the terms of service, you'll understand the nature of the new property, which is digital property, and it's different from property as we're used to. For one thing, under the terms of service, Theoretically, in many accounts, our digital assets cease, and ex cease to exist are eliminated once we are. It's a kind of different kind of property. It would be amazing if my house on McDonald Street, once I died, was eliminated. Bang! The, the plows came in. But that's what happens to a lot of our digital assets. The terms of service say that if you die, tough, it's over. In Facebook, they say that if you die, you have a choice. You can tell us before. <laughs> they can tell us before. You want your whole uh, Facebook uh, pages just eliminated, deleted. Fair enough. Or you can allow the Facebook uh, pages to be memorialized and frozen, essentially, and then get a, a digital legacy uh, administrator to allow some fooling around with those pages. In many, many cases, you, you stand to lose the content and often the value of those pages. There's nothing you can do because the operative law is not any law that we have, but simply the terms of service of the provider whether it be Ashley Madison, Facebook, or World of Warcraft. So what do you do now when you die with your digital assets? Many of us have many different digital assets. Well, don't tell anyone, but you have to give your password to somebody else because most of the services will not give your password to your grieving child or wife. Tough, they will say. So you've got to give your password to them during lifetime or at least arrange for them to be able to get them after you die. And I know there are a lot of commercial vaults, digital vaults that hold passwords that you can use too. Now if you do that, the chances are you will be breaking the terms of service of the particular provider and they will then immediately uh, banish you from the site. It's not a necessarily a good situation to be in. In the United States, in some situations where you break the terms of services, you're often subject to criminal sanctions as well. What happens if you're a parent and you would love to have the drawings and the photos of your 15-year-old? A little girl that you, you were never a friend or anything, you let her do things on her Facebook, but you really want the Facebook contents now that she's passed on. Can you get them? And the answer is uh, no. Facebook says no. Now, Facebook has been presented with a number of, uh, of court cases. They've been sued, and they've broken down on various grounds several times. 
but the basic situation in Facebook is if your loved one has items on Facebook and they die and you want to get to them, you want to uh, duplicate the contents, Facebook won't permit you to do that. We will eventually have to have some consumer legislation and some control of this wild west of law here, but for now, Canada is no more uh, in a confusing situation than Europe or the United States, maybe less so. And I'll just quickly, because I know it's eight and we're going on, who can make a will? Assume we, we get finally, after all this, to a will. Who can make a will? You have to be of the age of majority unless you're married. And there are special wills for service people and mariners. We talked previously about seniors, and seniors can't make a will unless they have capacity, and they can't revoke a will significantly unless they have capacity. There are two ways of making a will, a formal will, uh, and a holograph will, a formal will requires typing, two witnesses signed at the bottom, a holograph will, you just do it all in your writing, and it's signed by you at the end. We now have uh, a term in our Wills Act called substantial compliance, so that it means if you don't comply with these formalities, if the court really thinks that really was your will, they will accept it. The first clause in a will normally revokes all previous wills. I hereby revoke my all previous wills is the first sentence in most wills. And the second clause is the one in which your executor is appointed. And your executor is a person who has a duty to get your property in, no small job, maybe. Uh, in some uh, families, you have to make sure that the doors are locked and the things were um, tied down. Uh, and that you get the property in, you pay their debts, and then you transfer to the beneficiary or to the trust set up for the beneficiary. The executor doesn't need legal training. You don't need legal training to be executor. You get paid. Mostly fiduciary or trustee people don't get paid, but executors get paid up to 5% of the value of the estate. There is a formula. And uh, so if you have three or four siblings and one gets to be nominated to be executor, the others are going to be quite concerned because they will not get a fairly substantial amount of money. They might, your executor might get a grant of probate, and the executor might not get a grant of probate. A grant of probate is when the executor goes to the uh, court and says, A has died, this is his will, and I'm the person appointed under the will to administer that will. So there's not, in uncomplicated estates without real estate, uh, there's very likely not to be probate. Um, under your will, you make specific gifts to various friends and family. Um, I had one lady a long time ago who, who took this. We, we kind of tried to calm her down because she wanted to make long lists of people who were getting specific items. And this was going to cost so much for her to do this. And so what she did, this was non-legal, so what she did is everything in her house had a little tag as to who should get it. And so you sit there, a nice lady, you sit there and you'd have tea and you'd look under your teacup and there would be a tag of who get it. <laughs> that was her way of doing it. Not legal, but. Um, most wills have residuary clauses. After the specific gifts you give, the rest and residue of all of my estate, wheresoever, situate, whatsoever kind, to whomever, the most important people. Um, just quickly now, how do you revoke a will? Well, marriage revokes a will, um, but it doesn't revoke designations, as I reminded you. And also, divorce doesn't revoke a will, but it revokes 
gifts to the ex in the will. You can revoke a will by destroying it, not to be recommended, because it's so ambiguous. And then what happens if at the end you can't find the will? Or there was a will and you can't find any more. There is a presumption that there was a will and there's no longer will that the will was destroyed with an idea of revoking it. Even if a will's lost and you can prove it's lost, that doesn't get you very far. Because in order for a lost, to go, a lost will to go to probate, you have to know what's in that lost will. And it's very few people who really know by heart what goes into a lost will. Um, I want to talk about a few other things that I've kind of skipped over and skipped around a bit. Um, I've talked about these things. I want to talk a little bit about guardianship because the thing that I find a lot is that when X is, for one thing, you can only nominate guardians if you share or have custody of a child. And guardianship probably should go in a separate document from your will. And no matter what you say, and no matter what a single parent says about the X, the chances are if there are two parents and one dies, that the kids are going to go to the surviving parents. And the courts will always have the best interest of the children in mind. And a few final points here. We're not Melinda and Bill Gates, but we may want to make some charitable donations. And if we do, the thing that I find hardest is you, for clients to get the name correct, please, and the level that you're giving at correct, too. Uh, I think that's very important with respect to who you want to give the charitable gifts to. And finally, and the one thing that I, that I should mention because of some very unhappy uh, things that developed over one of the Canadian soldier a couple of years ago is the question of who has the right to your body for burial and who decides on burial. Is it mom? Is it dad? Is it your partner? Is it a kid? None of those. They might be your executor and they might not. Your executor has the right to your body and they will decide on burial. So if you're doing something different, I think that you better talk to your families before death rather than after. I knew a person who wanted to be put up in the trees like they did in the pal or whatever, and the birds ate them. Well, this <laughs> might, <laughs> it's probably illegal in Halifax anyway, but I think you should discuss that <laughs> with your family before that you do that. Anyway, uh, so that's all the main part of my uh, presentation to you tonight. I'm quite happy to stay around and answer questions, and I understand that some of you also have to uh, probably hurry on, and so we can have a little bit of a change over here. Thank you.